Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. My goodness. These people are pissed. You would have thought I kicked their dog or called them out as an entire group of lazy criminals and welfare queens. Oh, wait. I mean, these people take Thomas Sowell as unquestionably current and correct. It's like they believe in some version of Sowellian inerrancy, a gospel of Thomas, if you will. I just hope that one day someone will look at me the way libertarians look at Thomas Sowell. And they were killing me in the comments. I mean, some of the highlights. Arrogance and ignorance are a dangerous combination. Bald, stupid, and arrogant is no way to go through life. Why you got to come after me for the bald part? I can't even help that. A toddler whining about a genius. Is this parody? Because he seems like he's serious, but I almost can't tell. And some of his fans want me to read every Thomas Sowell book before I even make an opinion on the guy. And yes, I know Soul is a smart person. You don't have to call him a brilliant prodigy for like the hundredth time. His explanation of free market economics has obviously been very popular and gotten him a lot of credit with folks on the right and libertarians in specific. My goal was never to call out Thomas Sowell's economic outlook per se. And I get that it has some interaction with his social commentary, but my concern was primarily his social commentary. And that is what I focused on in my first video. But here we are, trudging the road to happy destiny on a journey towards arrogance and ignorance all the way to the bottom. So this time, instead of having some evangelical Christian as our intermediary, we're going to take words straight from the sacred cow's mouth. I'm going to let Soul speak for himself, and then I'm going to make some counterpoints that hopefully just make you think a little bit about what he is saying. From the progressive position a century ago to the progressive position today, racial assertions have ranged from the genetic determinism that we just discussed which proclaimed that race is everything as an explanation of group differences to the opposite view that racism yes. is the primary explanation of group differences. Yeah. So just look at this definition real quick. Uh, racial assertions have ranged from the genetic determinism. So he's talking about like early 20th century progressives who were, you know, basically eugenicist and believed that uh, you know, blacks were inferior genetically. Um, and so he's saying that they proclaimed that race is, again, the words are important, everything, as opposed to the opposite view today, that racism is the primary explanation. So I just want you to look at the difference between everything and primary explanation of group differences. So it's different to say that uh, race is everything versus systemic racism is the primary explanation of group differences. So the parallel that he's making is not quite in line. How did this happen? Oh, it happened because a lot of people uh, arrived at that, at that same con conclusion and they had IQ, high IQs and PhDs and that was the end of the story as far, as far as many people were concerned, all right? I mean, a, a high IQ and low information is a very dangerous combination. So here Sol is accusing, you know, all of the mainstream political scientists and sociologists of having high IQs, but not having good information. So basically Sol is saying, I know better than the consensus of the scholarship in this matter. That's quite a claim to make from Seoul. I, I have to, sorry, but you once told me, I'm talking to a Harvard man, of course, I'm very conscious of this. <laughs> you once told me, Peter, 
The main advantage of earning a Harvard degree is that you never again in all your life have to be intimidated by anyone who has a Harvard degree. <laughs> all right. Listen, Tom, for the most, as I read this book, for the most part, it's objective, it's, it's subjective throughout. It's calm, it's analytical. But when you take on this modern progressive position that racism accounts for anything, there are passages in which you're angry. I felt that there are passages yes. in which there's emotion that is very close. You mean to tell me that Thomas Sowell is a person? He's not just a machine that pumps out empirical data and objectivity in the face of an ignorant society? Okay. Median black family income has been lower than median white family income for generations. But the median per capita income of Asian groups is more than 15,000 a year higher than the media per capita income of white Americans. Is this the white supremacy we're so often warned about? To get a more well-rounded view about why Asians might do better than whites in America and certainly do better than uh, you know, native slavery descendant African Americans, we need to go back to good old President Lyndon B. Johnson and the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. So um, the Immigration and Nationality Act abolished quotas. The new law created a preference system that focused on immigrant skills and family relations with citizens or U.S. residents. So why is this important? It's important because prior to that bill, there were super tight restrictions on non-white immigrants coming to America. Heck, there were super hard restrictions on Eastern European immigrants who came to America. They uh, primarily only allowed Anglo Western European immigrants prior to 1965. So let's look at the Asian population in the United States, the Asian immigrant population in the United States from 1960 to 2019. So in 1960, it was only 491,000. And you can look over the years, you see an explosion around 1990, where it, uh, it basically doubles every year from the beginning. It's 491, 825, 2.5 million, almost 5 million, over 8 million, almost 11 million, all the way up to 14, uh, almost 14.1 million by 2019. So why does this have explanatory power in helping us understand why Asian immigrants, why Asian Americans might do better on average than even whites and especially native African Americans? Well, it's pretty simple. The reason that they do is because they have been only brought into the country in the last 50 to 60 years, and we have selected for the most economically viable, the ones with the most family stability and the people with the most professional credentials and selected for only them to come into the country. Well, it wouldn't matter what population it was. If you only took the best and brightest out of them and transferred them into another population, they're going to excel more than the average of a population that hasn't been selected for. It's really quite simple. And the same can be said, for instance, for Nigerian African immigrants who come into the United States. When you select for the most economically viable, the, mo the ones who have the best family connections and the ones who have the most educational and professional attainment, of course, you're gonna get a immigrant population that is more successful than a wide, huge 50 million group of people who have not been selected for in that same way. So I think the point that Seoul is trying to make is these Asians do better because they have a better culture in comparison to especially urban African-Americans. And as a basic point of fact, I agree with Thomas Sowell in that different cultures value different things and would even submit that some cultures are better than others at producing what Americans 
would describe as good outcomes. I think soul and others often ignore like what is the entry point of a given subculture into American society and what resources, what corporate knowledge can the individuals in that subgroup, like what are what is the corporate knowledge that they're privy to? So if you look at, say, Asian immigrants or Jewish immigrants into America, like they can draw on cultural knowledge that goes back like thousands of years. But what was the starting point for slaves who were brought to America? Like what was the cultural starting point for them? Well, their African culture was wiped out like within the first, from what we know, within the first few generations of them becoming slaves. So their, their literal cultural starting point was slavery. And af even after slavery, like what type of culture was developed? Well, it was a culture that developed based on being discriminated against and uh, you know having acts of violent racial animosity carried out against them. So I know Seoul likes to talk about how other civilizations have had slavery and such, but I don't know if we could identify a population who was the slaves in a given nation and then freed in that given nation and then suppressed for another hundred plus years in that given nation and then like slowly rolled out as like supposedly equal uh, in terms of their de jure and de facto rights. And so from that perspective, I think America is a very unique situation. And the African-Americans who live primarily uh, in urban environments do not have the cultural capital that many of these other groups have. And the reason they don't have this cultural capital is because systemic racism. Within a quarter of a century, in no year has the annual poverty rate of Black married couple families, married couple families, been as high as 10%. And in no year has the poverty rate of Americans as a whole been as low as 10%. If Black poverty is caused by systemic racism, do racists make an exception for Blacks who are married? Well, our system is designed so that married people do better. So I don't think it's outstanding that African Americans who are, are married do better. Like pointing that out is just kind of like saying there are successful Black people. <laughs> like the point doesn't really carry that much weight um, because what most social scientists and political scientists look at is the disproportionate rates of marriage within the Black community and the disproportionate economic disadvantages of said Black community. So if, and I know Sol does this, if he wants to say that one of the reasons that, you know, African-Americans struggle more is because they're married less and they're single mothers uh, who are raising the kids, then sure, I could say yes. But you know, we have to go back to what is the cultural foundation of this group and what is the historical context that that cultural foundation was built upon. And for African Americans, the historical context is slavery to a hundred years of systemic racism uh, de jour. And now I would argue uh, 50 to 60 more years of de facto racial uh, discrimination. So, you know, just saying that married black couples do well, like that doesn't really make much of a difference in the conversation. There are a variety of reasons why all types of individual people do better, do worse in terms of economic attainment. Um, but we know that our system is designed so that married people will do better. If you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, you will see pretty quickly that single motherhood is not correlated uh, to being poor. And because they have a system that is designed so that single mothers 
uh, can have a better chance of raising their kids. So part of it is the system that we live in. And the other part of it is, okay, there's a disproportionate rate of African Americans who aren't married, but why is that? And if you say it's their culture, where does culture come from? It comes from history and the material conditions of history. I guess you're allowed to be angry. <laughs> Again, we're just taking stuff in uncritically without giving any historical context to the situation. Yes. Well, well yes. I don't mean. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Man, God bless this dude. Like, when I'm 93 years old, I ain't even going to make it to 93 years old, to be honest. Like, I'm going to be dead long before that. But, like, for this dude, I will give it to soul. Like, for this dude to be talking this coherently at 93 years old is super impressive. All props to soul for that, uh, even if I disagree with a lot of what he has to say. Do you have the feeling when you're addressing this notion that racism accounts for everything? Do you have the feeling that there's that, that the that the arguments are subtle? It's persuasive. You can forgive someone for buying that argument, mm. or do you have the feeling that it's willful? That the but, case is so clearly mistaken that there's a willfulness about it? No, I, I don't. I don't. I think that, the, that, that people don't look for for certain evidence, and therefore they don't find it. Oh, the irony. <laughs> Like, so why didn't you look at the evidence of like when Asian Americans came to this country primarily? And why didn't you look at the evidence of how our immigration system, our legal immigration system, highly selects for the most productive Asian citizens? So, in fact, it's Seoul who's not looking at uh, a lot of the evidence and leaving out a lot of the context. Basis of what they know at, at a given time, this may be very plausible. The problem is that you don't. What you really need are other people with a different orientation, who are who who are, who are skeptical and who will then look for things and find things that that are very different from that. So all of you guys attacking me just for challenging Soul, I encourage you to listen to Soul. He's saying that you need critics, you need countering opinions to provide extra facts that may change our calculations. At the end of the day, like from an epistemological standpoint, we are all in this game of systemic racism and racial disparities in America making an inference to the best explanation. Like there's no objective truth to this thing, or if there is an objective truth to it, like we're grasping trying to find it. So we're all in this boat together. And so what Soul is telling you is there should be people like me who push back even against Soul. If Soul is going to push back against the academic establishment, then why can't I push back against Soul? One of the things that uh, I, that I, that I, I found uh, interesting was the, the, the uh, fact that there are various counties in the United States uh, which are among the poorest counties in, in, in the country. And six of those counties have a, have a, a, a population that ranges from 90% white to 100% white. Appalachian counties. Yeah. Kentucky. Yes. Yes. Kentucky yes. and Ohio, as I recall. Yeah. And, 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 but mainly it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the hillbilly communities. Right. They're, these are people who have faced zero racism. They are white. Happy. And they are white and, and, and zero racism. Again, I think this is just a really weak point from Seoul. If you look at any population, any group of millions of people, you're going to have a certain percentage of those people be the poorest of the poor. And if the United States is a majority white country, which it still is, although that's changing, then it would make sense that when you're looking at some of the poorest communities in the United States, that there are going to be a number of predominantly white communities that are poor just by the sheer proportion of whites compared to other races in the United States. 
but you know you know why would there be a number of appalachian communities that appear to be the poorest in the nation like because they also struggle from some of the things that uh minorities struggle from like less access to health care including addiction treatment uh not as close of a proximity to social services underdeveloped transportation and infrastructure but you know those can be reasons that are affected by race or not affected by race no one is saying everything is affected by race unless you're talking about the most far extreme anti-racist people which i clearly uh, and vehemently disagree with on a lot of things but it simply doesn't follow that because a select group of majority white area uh, communities are among the poorest that whites are poorer on average than blacks like it simply doesn't follow for that or are there as many poor white communities on average uh, per capita as there are black communities on average per capita between the two races? Of course not. I don't think this point about Appalachian communities really moves the needle much in favor of systemic racism not having strong explanatory power. It's just pointing out that some white people are poor. <laughs> like, that's all it does. Systemic racism isn't real because some white people are poor. White privilege doesn't exist because there are other types of privilege. But uh, despite that, the, these these hillbilly counties had uh, income incomes that were not only lower than the national average, they were lower than the average of, of black incomes for a, a period of, of half a century. It may have been longer than that because I only went through half a century. So you mean to tell me that the poorest of the poor white communities have a lower average income than the average black family in a community? Like, that's not what we're measuring against, man. <laughs> we're measuring the proportions in the given races and ethnic groups. We're not measuring the poorest versus the average. That wouldn't make sense. So to wrap up part two, we're going to do a part three. But I know I have to keep these things short enough so people don't lose their attention span. But before we go, I just want to reiterate the uh, importance of a cultural starting point for different ethnic groups. But I want to tell a hypothetical story that may help explain why African Americans through systemic racism, don't have the cultural capital that the rest of us have, and why that is a problem that we should address. And the next video, we're going to get into the policy discussion of does policy work and how we should address it. Let's just pretend, hypothetically, even though this is a story that would ring true to a very large number of African slaves who were brought to this country. Uh, let's say one family are the descendants of slaves who arrived in the US back in the 1700s. The first three and four generations of their ancestors were stripped of their African culture and virtually brainwashed, forbidden to read, and taught that God himself wanted them to be subservient to their masters. Once their lineage was finally freed in the 1800s, they faced discrimination, intimidation, and violence, were subject to vagrancy laws, black codes, the one-drop rule, uh, strategically prevented from voting due to literacy, uh, literacy tests, which they struggled with because, you know, they weren't allowed to read for a really long time. Uh, and grandfather clauses, which prevented them from voting as well. But despite that, the family forged on and eventually migrated from the South to a Northern city in one of the great migrations. You know, when the Second World War happened, 
uh, some members of this family fought as Americans on the battlefield. One son was lucky enough to survive, but found when he came home, he faced violent mobs who decried him for wearing a military uniform. Even worse, he wasn't eligible for any veteran benefits because of his race. But still, he worked hard and built a decent life for his family for a while. And though they were still not treated equally by law through discrimination, his sons grow up and find jobs in a local manufacturing plant, uh, despite not getting the same labor benefits uh, as their white counterparts. But then something started to happen. The manufacturing jobs started to, started to disappear. And you know who was the first people to be let go when that happened? Yep, you guessed it, the Black families. The once proud neighborhood uh, that these Black families had begun to build began to deteriorate and any Black-owned businesses shut down. All the white workers, though, they left the city limits, white flight, in search of new jobs and new places. Uh, but this family was stuck. They couldn't even get like a loan. If, and if they could, no one would sell them a house anywhere except in a similar Black inner city neighborhood. They were trapped and out of work. And then the heroin started flowing in during the Vietnam War. And the community was ravaged. And then into the 1980s, uh, crack cocaine is flooded into the neighborhood. And some of that welfare even disincentivized Black families from staying together by rewarding single motherhood. Yes, that was a real problem. But on top of that, the war on drugs was arresting and imprisoning the Black male population at staggering rates. And so let's say this same family who started as slaves back in the 1700s up until this day, their children are the sons of perhaps gang members who are in jail or their foster kids in the system without any uh, parents to give them knowledge. What cultural capital are these families supposed to draw from in comparison to other ethnic groups in the United States? It would be important for me to try to understand that situation as best I could. I believe you have to provide opportunities, community stability, uh, things like the child tax credit, which brought millions of children out of poverty and have a strong enough educational and social safety net so that people are not living in abject poverty. So we'll see you next time on the Gloves Off podcast where Seoul will try to convince us that any policy that we try to implement to help reduce poverty and systemic discrimination and racism uh, comes with such consequences that we shouldn't try it, anything. <laughs> All my haters out there, bring it on. I don't really care. The internet is mean. We'll see you guys later. Peace.